In a lot of our examples, you're going to see data collators popping up over and over. They're used in both the PyTorch and the TensorFlow workflows, and maybe even in JAX, but no one really knows what's happening in JAX. We do have a research team working on it though, so maybe they'll, they'll tell us soon. But coming back on topic, what are data collators? Data collators collate data. That's not that helpful, but to be more specific, they put together a list of samples into a single training mini batch. For some tasks, the data collator can be very straightforward. For example, when you're doing sequence classification, all you really need from your data collator is that it pads your samples to the same length and concatenates them into a single tensor. But for other workflows, data collators can be quite complex as they handle some of the pre-processing needed for that particular task. So when you want to use a data collator, uh, for PyTorch users, you usually pass the data collator to your trainer object. In TensorFlow, it's a bit different. The easiest way to use a data collator is to pass it to the toTFDataset method of your dataset. And this will give you a, a TensorFlow tfdata.dataset um, that you can then pass to model.fit. You'll see these approaches used in the examples and notebooks throughout this course. Uh, also note that all of our collators take a return tensors argument. You can set this to PT to get PyTorch tensors, TF to get TensorFlow tensors, or NP to get NumPy arrays. Uh, for backward compatibility reasons, the default value is PT, so PyTorch users don't even have to set this argument most of the time. And so as a result, they're often totally unaware that this argument even exists. Um, we can learn something from this, which is that the beneficiaries of privilege are often the ones most blind to its existence. Uh, but okay, coming back, let's see how some specific data collators work in action. Uh, although again, remember, if none of the built-in data collators do what you need, you can always write your own, and they're often quite short. So first we'll see the basic data collators. These are default data collator and data collator with padding. These are the ones you should use if your labels are straightforward and your data doesn't need any special processing before being ready for training. Uh, note that because different models have different padding tokens, data collator with padding will need your model's tokenizer so it knows how to pad sequences properly. Uh, the default data collator doesn't need uh, a tokenizer to work, but it will as a result throw an error unless all of your sequences are the same length, so you should be aware of that. Moving on though, a lot of the other data collators aside from the basic two are, they're usually designed to handle one specific task. And so I'm gonna show you a couple here. These are data collator for token classification and data collator for seek to seek. And the reason these tasks need special collators is because their labels are variable in length. In token classification, there's one label for each token. And so the length of the labels is the length of the sequence. Um, while in seek to seek the labels are a sequence of tokens that can be a variable length that can be very different from the length of the input sequence. So in both of these cases, we handle collating that batch by padding the labels as well, as you can see here in this example. So inputs and labels will need to be padded if we want to join uh, samples of variable length into the same mini batch. That's always the case across all data collators, and that's exactly what these data collators will do for us in the, you know, for these particular tasks. So there's one final data collator I want to show you as well, just in this lecture, and that's the data collator for language modeling. So it's very important, and it's firstly because language models are just so foundational to do for everything uh, we do with NLP these days. Um, but secondly, because it has two modes that do two very different things. So you choose which mode you want with the MLM argument. Set it to true for masked language modeling and set it to false for causal language modeling. Uh, so collating data for causal language modeling is actually quite straightforward. The model is just making predictions for what token comes next. And so your labels are more or less just a copy of your inputs and the collator will handle that and ensure that the inputs and labels are padded correctly. When you set MLM to true though, you get a very, you know, quite different behavior that's different from any other data collator. And that's because setting MLM to true means masked language modeling. And that means the labels need to be, you know, the inputs need to be masked. Uh, so what does that look like? 
So recall that in masked language modeling, the model is not predicting the next word. Instead, we randomly mask out some tokens and the model predicts all of them at once. It tries to kind of fill in the blanks for those masked tokens. But the process of random masking is surprisingly complex. Um, if we follow the protocol from the original BERT paper, we need to replace some tokens with a mask token, some other tokens with a random token, and then we keep a third set of tokens unchanged. Um, you know, this is not the lecture to go into you know, the specifics of that or why we do it. Uh, you, know, you can always check out the original BERT paper if you're curious. It's well written, it's easy to understand. Um, the main thing to know here is that it, it can be a real pain and quite complex to implement that yourself. But the data collator for language modeling will do it for you when you set MLM to true. And that's an example of the more intricate uh, pre-processing that some of our data collators do. And that's it. So this covers the most commonly used data collators and the tasks they're used for. And hopefully now you'll know when to use data collators and which one to choose when you have for your specific task.